The trend in the budget PC gaming market lately is for cheap Haswell E Xeons. These decade old former workstation and server CPUs are the current meta for people who want a game but can't get hold of the modern CPUs and platforms many of us take for granted. Obviously, when you pick up one of these 10 year old chips for gaming, you accept that it won't compete with modern CPUs in terms of performance. Or do you? To be clear, this video isn't exactly a buyer's guide. The Xeon E5, V3 and V4 CPUs have many positive attributes. Compared to the more mainstream i5 and i7 CPUs that can be had for similar prices, you'll be getting more cores, threads and cache, all of which are factors that make them surprisingly capable for modern gaming. But they don't tend to be competitive in terms of clock speeds and especially efficiency. The main attractions are price, availability and simplicity. You can get a bundle deal on AliExpress and be up and gaming in no time. If you want to tinker with stuff like turbo boost unlocking and base clocks, then there's some extra performance to be found, but actual multiplier overclocking gets pretty gnarly and the price to performance argument very quickly goes out the window. For one thing, only the E5 1600V3 series has unlocked multipliers, and not all of them at that. The CPU I'm using today is the 1660V3, which has 8 cores, 16 threads and 20 megabytes of L3 cache, and I'll be using its unlocked multiplier to take it to an all-core frequency of 4.3 GHz which is as high as this chip wants to go. I've already tested the 6-core version, the 1650v3, in a video a few months back, but that's really about it for viable unlocked Xeons on this platform. The quad-core 1620v3 and other lower models are locked. The V4 chips are all locked too, and the higher-end 1680v3 is a better binned 1660 that may have a little extra headroom for overclocking. The 10, 12 and 14 core models are unicorns, seemingly existing only on the various CPU databases on the internet, and if an engineering or qualifying sample ever turned up, it would probably cost more than a modern i9. A more worrying concern is motherboard choice. You can stick with the more well-known marks like Gigabyte, MSI, ASUS and so forth, but they're getting hard to find for reasonable prices in the UK, and I shudder to think how hard they'd be to find outside of the global north. The aforementioned AliExpress specials aren't true X99s at all, they're mostly made from salvaged server chipsets, repurposed into something more consumer friendly, and repackaged in lies. That being said, there are a couple of boards that could do the trick. As I don't actually know all that much about AliExpress motherboards, I spoke to someone with a lot more experience than me. Mirkonst Hardware is probably YouTube's foremost authority on the subject, and he provided me with some details on the most overclocking friendly boards from Machinist and Huananji. He also told me about their quirks, stuff that you don't really worry about when using a big brand board, but which will make some budget options more appealing than others. Some AliExpress X99s are theoretically capable of multiplier overclocking, but lack a good enough VRM to make clocks higher than 4.1 GHz a reality, and apparently even the best out there are limited to around 4.3 regardless of the CPU. Then there's the actual practical side, the included BIOS on some of these boards doesn't actually let you change the multiplier. To sum up then, overclocking a Socket 2011 V3 Xeon involves overpaying for a 1600 V3 compared to a 2600 V3 or V4, overpaying for a decade old branded motherboard from the ever shrinking pool of working samples on eBay, or buying a more realistically priced option from AliExpress, but then possibly paying some rando for a custom BIOS, and then paying through the nose for the hundreds of watts of electricity this system could potentially use. In short, this really isn't worth doing, at least not in your own daily driver, but even if you were inclined to try and do so, would you get better performance than a modern i3-12100F?
To find out, my test setup consists of my Gigabyte G1 gaming motherboard, which I picked up for 100 quid a couple of years ago, but which is now appreciated by at least 25%. Four 8GB sticks of DDR4 running at 3200CL16 in quad channel, a 240mm Cooler Master AIO, and a Radeon RX 6900 XT. The i3 was tested with both DDR5 4800 and 6000 using the same graphics card, and I've thrown in the results from the Ryzen 5 4500 for good measure. Even though Valorant doesn't really load up an 8-core CPU as well as other, more complex games, even at stock clocks, the 1660v3 can deliver a pretty reasonable result. 255 FPS on average wouldn't look bad on a high refresh monitor, though the 1% lows would ruin the experience somewhat compared to the i3. Cranking up the multiplier sends the Xeon into the stratosphere, with a 330 FPS average that remains competitive with the 12100F, even with the faster 6000 speed RAM. Fortnite performance mode obviously hits some high FPS with any CPU, so long as you don't pay too much attention to the low end. After a couple of dummy runs to iron out some of the more severe stutters, at stock clocks the 1660v3 manages 240 FPS, with 1% 1 of 122. The overclock doesn't have quite as big an impact this time, with the average not quite hitting 300 and lows at about 150, but it still leaves the i3 in the dust. Counter-Strike 2 sees the smallest improvement from overclocking of any of the DX11 games. The average at stock settings is 173, with 1% 1 lows of 88. Throwing an extra gigahertz at it only increases the average by 10% to 200 FPS, which, while fine, still begs the question of whether it's even worth it. The 12100F can hit similar numbers even with the slower RAM, Although I didn't get numbers for the 6000 test, I'm pretty sure it's going to do even better. The DX12 results start off strong. At stock settings, Warzone sees averages of about 120 FPS with lows of 70, sitting right between the Ryzen 4500 and the i3. Not bad, but we can do way better. At 4.3 GHz, the average climbs to 149, almost 25% improved from the 3.3 GHz results. 1% lows also benefit by about the same amount, only dropping to 90 FPS. Notoriously demanding on both the GPU and CPU, the only chips I've tested that can hit a stable 60fps in Starfield's new Atlantis are higher-end, more recent-gen models like the i5-12400F and Ryzen 5 7500F, so it's no surprise that the 1660v3 falls short of the mark. The average is just under 60 and 1% lows only linger in the 30s. With the overclock, things are dramatically improved, with the average gaining about 15% and 1% lows increasing into the low 40s. Overclocking the Xeon actually saves the Cyberpunk experience, at least in standard rendering. Without it, the 1660v3 can manage 83 FPS overall, but there are substantial dips in heavier parts of the city, and the 1% lows are just 48 FPS. Cranking up the clocks brings the average to about 100 FPS, and the lows are now just above 60. Alas, with the RT Ultra mode, things improve, but not by enough to make a major difference, as the average climbs from 51 to 59. Every now and again, The Last of Us will see a few tiny frame time spikes as new things load in, and that can ruin what's otherwise a pretty smooth experience even at stock settings. Pushing the clocks up doesn't completely cure this, but the 0.1% count moves up from 25 to 56, meaning those little spikes are a good deal smaller. The last two titles are included simply for academic interest and not really for practical reasons. I'm told Dragon's Dogma 2 isn't smooth on a Ryzen 7 7800X 3D, so anything I'm likely to test it on doesn't stand a chance. 
Still, it's another disappointingly small improvement. A 30% increase in clock speed only gives a 10% uplift in average performance and 14% in 1% lows. 0.1% gain almost 30%, though that's not really saying much. <music> Lastly, Jedi Survivor shows nothing but contempt for the old Haswell chip. It might be a passable experience if you lock it at 30 FPS, but any higher than that and you're gonna feel the dips in frame rate whenever things start to get busy. The average of 57 FPS at stock settings looks fine, but the lows of 28 FPS really aren't. Overclocking gains about 16% on average and 17% at the low end, which does bring those 1% up above 30 FPS. But that's still some damningly faint praise. For productivity, the i3 gets absolutely wrecked by the old 8-core. The resolve render time is reduced by almost 3 minutes even at stock settings, and the overclocked run drops another 4.5 minutes. At 4.3GHz, the 1660v3 actually sits in between the i5-12400F and the Ryzen 5 5600X. Blender is a little less impressive, as the classroom test puts the modern i5 and Ryzen 5 well ahead of the Haswell e-chip, but the Xeon still puts in a better showing than the i3 with either slower or faster DDR5. You might be looking through these benchmarks and thinking about how good those power consumption figures look. Well, I can tell you that's pretty far from the truth. I don't know if it's specifically my motherboard or if it's a wider issue, but neither Afterburner nor Hardware Info 64 is reporting accurate power consumption figures. During the Cinebench run at stock settings with only the CPU actually working hard, I saw usage from the wall at about 176 watts. Overclocking more than doubled that to 355 watts. As I said at the beginning, this whole exercise is mostly pretty impractical for real end users. At 50 to 60 pounds for the motherboard and 30 pounds for the CPU, you're already in first gen Ryzen territory. And at the end of the day, you'll still have a decade old CPU with a semi professionally designed motherboard. Once you factor in the custom BIOS, higher end cooling and running costs, you could make a strong argument for an i5-12400F or Ryzen 5 5600 that will outperform even an overclocked 1660v3 and do so using a fraction of the power. Still, that wasn't really the point of the test. I just continued to be impressed at what's possible with an obscure CPU, even one from 10 years ago. Look out for more from this particular chip soon, as I'm going to see how well it and the rest of a high-end 2014 gaming PC would have held up over the last decade. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.